so much for your patience and thank you um, to the folks who are in the waiting room as well as I mentioned before we were having some technical difficulties but we're back and we're better um, and we're going to go ahead and get started I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Stephanie to kick us off awesome thank you so much Shelly uh, bienvenidos everybody welcome my name is Stephanie Barra I'm the executive director here at All In Education um, we are um, a new education advocacy uh, organization here in, in Arizona, really focused on advancing um, equity, opportunity, and justice in our education system. We're doing this session today in partnership with our friends and colegas at Instituto and Tri Advocates. Sorry, Shelly, for the back and forth. I apologize. Um, but yes, very excited to have this, this team together to present an overview for you all on how the legislature works, how a bill becomes a law, and then we'll be um, having a panel discussion from uh, some members of the legislature and, and some distinguished guests. So, so appreciate you all being here. Um, and thank you so much. I'm actually gonna toss it over to um, our, our board chair founder, also founder of Instituto, uh, Luis Avila, to share a little bit about uh, their work at Instituto. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this amazing education watch party. Um, big uh, shout out to all of you who are uh, joining us from all over the state. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with you today for several reasons. One of them is because we are actually um, really looking into how do we ensure that our voices are represented at every single level of government. Uh, Stephanie uh, spoke, uh, I, my name is Luis Avila and I am the founder of Instituto. And what's Instituto? So Instituto's mission is to build political power with low income and communities of color all across the state. Um, this state will become a multiracial majority by 2027, according to the trends. And we know that simply uh, the way that we're going with governing, uh, with civic participation, with decision making, has to fundamentally change if we want our life, live experiences to inform policy making and inform practices uh, uh, across our society and here across Arizona. So our, our theory of change is that we accelerate and incubate uh, the solutions that come from the communities that are most impacted by social inequities. How do we accelerate? Well, we work very closely with existing organizations in the community that are doing work in civic engagement, in advocacy, or power building uh, across the state. We do things like fellowships, trainings, communities of practice, and a big shout out to Shelly Jackson, who is our training and engagement uh, deputy director, and she manages a lot of these programs. We're about to announce our next uh, Monsoon Fellowship uh, in a couple of days, 21 people from all over the state that will be joining us as the next leaders uh, of uh, the state of Arizona. On the other side, we also are an incubator. And what does it mean is that we scan for capacities and uh, gaps that we may have in our communities, in low income and communities of color, to think and imagine what we need to build an infrastructure so that we can actually advance and build the power that we need to govern ourselves in the future, to have, so we can have self-determined lives, so that nothing is decided about us without us. And that is such an example of All in Education, a project that we help incubate uh, by having conversations with multiple community members, uh, creating a hiring committee, and bringing on board this incredible leader that we're so proud to have at the helm of organization, Stephanie Parra. So that's Instituto. We invite you to stay engaged with us if you haven't heard from us. And if you uh, are from Instituto and you haven't heard about All in Education, please stay connected with this amazing organization that it's already changing lives and changing the landscape of education in the state of Arizona. And with that said, I want to now introduce you to Lourdes Peña, who is from Tri Advocates, and she'll tell us a little bit about, uh, about her before we get started. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lourdes Peña. I am a professional lobbyist with Tri Advocates, but um, I am really, really honored to represent the ON Education at the State Capitol. Our role with the ON Education is to be 
part of their advocacy and, and work in, in conjunction with the ON education team to make sure that their priorities are heard and discussed at the state capitol and that we influence um, the, the lawmakers and make sure that the voice of our members in our community is heard, uh, both at the state capitol as well as any, any state agency that impacts uh, our legislative and any community that impacts um, our Latino students all throughout the state. So happy to be here and I'm excited to share with you guys. We're gonna present a PowerPoint, um, very high level, just to walk you through how the legislative process works. But uh, if you are familiar with it, I apologize if there's any repetition. If there are questions that you have, you can put them in the, in the chat box. Hopefully we can come back and answer some of those questions, but I'll be sharing my screen pretty, pretty soon here um, to show the uh, PowerPoint and walk you guys through that. Thank you, Lourdes. And before we uh, dive into that, we're actually going to pass it right back to Stephanie to give folks a little overview about All in Ed, so that way they're all informed about the amazing organizations here. So I'll pass it back to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Shelly. With my excitement to welcome you all, I didn't give you an overview um, of our, our programs at All in Ed. Uh, Luis, you know, he mentioned Instituto is an incubator, um, and so they they did incubate all all in education. Now we are a standalone 501c3 organization, um, and we are really focused on building uh, building power in our communities. As as Luis referenced, making sure that the uh, communities that that are most impacted by the inequities in our education system truly have a voice and a seat in decision making rooms. Um, and so we're building a pipeline of leaders. That is the core of our work. We launched uh, last fall a, a soft pilot of the Parent Educator Academy, uh, which Luis already shared is, is already impacting uh, lives across Phoenix and Yuma County, um, South County Yuma, where I am from. Um, and it, it has been so powerful to engage with, with parents in our communities who were disproportionately impacted by COVID and really empowering them to get involved and engaged. I see Danny Hernandez on our team. Um, he's been working so closely with our parents, building relationships with them uh, and encouraging them to get involved, uh, to become leaders in their community. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be launching a pilot program this fall called Adelante Fellowship. Uh, if you are uh, a next gen leader interested in, in learning more about your role in, in advocating for a more equitable and just education system, please stay, stay tuned. Um, we are, are uh, opening applications for Adelante soon. I also see Livier Delgadillo who joined our team as our leadership programs director. Livier is helping us get that program off the ground this year. And of course, our, our incredible communications director Anais Baesteros is also on the call. Um, and, and our team can help you uh, engage in, in, in our program work. And finally, for those of you that are currently either, you know, new uh, school board members, uh, considering running for office, or, or really, again, uh, leaders in our community who want to take their leadership to the next level, we're going to have a three-month academy this fall called LISTO. Uh, the LISTO Academy actually stands for Leaders in Support of Transformational Opportunities, where we will help leaders navigate um, how to effectively move an, ag an agenda, uh, that an agenda that's rooted in closing gaps in opportunity and advancing justice across our system. Um, and so we want our programs to be truly, our, our programs will be truly rooted in, in guiding leaders um, on how to navigate the system. Uh, you'll hear directly from Lourdes right now, who, who will help us uh, with the, the program side. Um, on you know, how the system is structured, how it works, what is the role that we as leaders play in, in transforming our system to get better outcomes for our community. So that is the work that we're getting off the ground here at All In Ed. I encourage you to get involved. Um, and so you can find more information at allineducation.org. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Lourdes and Shelly to get us into our presentation. Thank you so much, Shelly. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Luis. Um, obviously, we're doing amazing work here in Arizona, um, and we are super excited for this partnership today. I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Lourdes to start short, uh, sharing her screen, and we're going to get into how a bill becomes a law and all that good stuff. 
Yes, thank and you. thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to kind of, when we share the screen, you don't see the faces that are talking. So this is who's going to be talking. But uh, right before I start sharing the screen, I, I would love for folks who are hearing here, um, just type into the chat box, what is your level of um, understanding or familiarity with the legislature? Do you know what the legislature is? Uh, is this the first time you even hear about them? Just any any insight if you have um, about what the leg what the legislature is, type it in the chat box. And if you don't know who they are, type that too. Uh, and we can kind of have a little bit more of an interactive uh, discussion here. So here, um, I think you guys can see my screen now. Can you see my PowerPoint? Nope, not yet. One second. Nope, you're not seeing that one. So we're good. Um, we're good? Okay. Perfect. So you can see the PowerPoint now. Um, let's start from the beginning. So just, I just wanted to point out here as I'm speaking, you'll see at the bottom, uh, if, if you're not familiar with this tool, uh, PowerPoint allows for translation and, and it allows for any language translation. When you're using PowerPoint in any kind of capacity, you can activate this for presentations or not, and you can translate as you as you see fit. And, and you'll see at the bottom that it's gonna be translating what I'm saying, but si quieren que hablemos en español, también hablamos en español. So for today, uh, the agenda is really like uh, Stephanie walked us through is just an overview of what the legislature is, how a bill becomes a law, and more importantly, uh, how we can advocate and how we can make our voices be heard at the state capitol. So this is the state legislature. It's the state capitol located in downtown Phoenix. So we're not talking about the, the Congress that so we tend to get confused. I, I know before I got involved in politics, when I would hear about the state legislature, I would kind of think that it was happening in Washington, DC. No, the state capitol, it's it's our capital as, as members and community members of the um, state of Arizona. And it's open for us to go visit when it's not COVID time at any point. And, and that's what we we really should be doing getting engaged and coming in to make our voices be heard. So how do they get there? Um, how do the legislators, state legislators get there? We vote for them. So the state, Arizona is divided in 30 legislative districts and we vote for every seat that is then elected. So they are essentially working for us, the voters who put them in that place. Um, the Senate has a total of 30 senators and the House of Representatives has a total of 60, rep um, 60 representatives. So it's 90 total that are essentially working at the state capitol representing and should be representing the interest of their um, constituents. Like everything else in politics, it's all based on party, right? Who you vote and who's in control of it. It's dictated by who wins elections. So for the House, just wanted to showcase, um, the House is made up, like I said before, of 60 members. There's a total of 31 Republicans and 29 Democrats. In the Senate, there's a total of 16 uh, Republicans and 14 Democrats. What that means for numbers, to put it in simple terms, is it's very tight. Um, the political parties, the margin is very tight, very close. Uh, and all it takes in both House and Senate is one person to not be, one person from the Republican Party to not be aligned um, and kill something that Democrats support or vice versa. It really requires in some cases for folks to work together because um, of how close it is, it makes it a little more comp complicated for people to pass bills just uh, on a party line vote. So why does it matter? Why should you care about this? Why should you even look into politics, right? I mean, we are so caught up in our day-to-day -day lives that it's like, well, I have a lot of problems to deal with. I don't have time to figure out what 90 people are doing in downtown Phoenix. Well, 
that could be true and it is true most of the time but whether you care or not um they it's going to impact you so uh whether you take interest in politics or not uh politics will take an impact on you because the laws that they're considering will have um a direct impact on our day to day lives and in this case education policy so um people get involved. And in 2018, I know a lot of people on this call were very involved and you probably watched from afar uh, what was called the Red for Red movement where you had hundreds, um, thousands of people march down to the Capitol and made their voice be heard. It was parents, teachers, students, uh, grandparents, you name it. Um, just people who were really focused in increasing funding for K-12 education and they made a standing. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if many of the people on this call were in those, <laughs> were in this photo that you could see where it's, it's not very appreciative, but you could see all the red that it, it literally took mile, miles from downtown Phoenix to the Capitol, just a, a sea of red showcasing uh, people, want, people wanting to be heard at the state Capitol and demanding more funding for um, K-12 education. So at a glance, right, what, what happens? Um, the photos that you see here is 2021 has been very different than a typical year. Um, in the sense that COVID hit us a year ago, and for obvious reasons, safety reasons, we cannot be in, in person, we cannot be at the state capitol like we used to be, and there's a lot of different changes in processes. So like the first photo, I'm not sure how much you can appreciate, but the first photo you can see is, is the Senate, and there's people, the senators are working, they're wearing face masks. The, the second photo here to the lower left corner, you see a member of the House of Representatives testifying, wearing a mask. You see the plastic right around them, trying to protect them for, from expanding the virus. Um, but, you know, obviously social distancing can be very difficult in these small rooms. Uh, therefore, you can also see that technology came into place and now members are learning just like all the rest of us how to use technology. There's um, people can vote remotely from their offices and not having to be there on the floor where you see people standing. So this is just kind of to show how it's, it's working, the, the processes that are happening. And then big picture, just wanted to let you know we are on the day 73 of the legislative uh, session. What that means is typically session, the legislature works typically full time from January to May. That's that's the standard time. That being said, you know, advocacy is year round. You don't just stop working because the legislators are not at the Capitol. But as of now, we're on day 73. We should be planning to be done with their legislative session by sometime May, maybe June. It all varies. There's no hard date. But I just wanted to showcase big picture. Legislators typically hear hundreds of bills. I mean, this year, it's a record, uh, record number. This year, there was a total of 1700 bills introduced on average every year legislators consider about 1200 1300 bills of all those bills and ideas that are introduced only about a quarter of that gets signed into law so we we still don't know how many are going to be signed but for this year we know that a total of 204 bills impact title um title 15 which is um impacts uh, k-12 education so now how a bill becomes a law. And if you know, if you've ever participated on the chat box, you can put it in there. If you've ever come to the Capitol and you ever had to testify on a bill, type that in there, share your experience. But how a bill becomes a law, it's a, it's a pretty detailed process. And I'm just gonna go into a very high level. Any state law, it comes from a person, right? And any any idea comes from somebody. It could either be a normal citizen, a parent, a teacher, a student. It could be a group. It could be OAN Education who thought, you know, based on our members, we think we should push this bill. It could be uh, Instituto based on our fellowships and our work that we do. We think this law should change. It could be an actual legislator, a senator or a representative like the folks you're gonna meet later. But any idea becomes, you know, it starts from somebody then it becomes a little more detailed, right? Then you go in and get the staff to draft the bill. After that, it has to go to both chambers. That's why you see House and Senate. But I'll just walk you through this House piece. 
it has to go through both chambers. Um, you go through, if it's a house bill, you're gonna go through a house committee and you're gonna hear testimony in the house. And that's where we, the public, you, the public can come in and testify and share your input and, and discuss whether or not you like the bill. After that, if it passes, the committee, it goes to what we call the House floor, which would be in this case 60 members, they debate it, they talk about it, there's opportunities to make amendments, to change things, if they think it's a good idea, um, and if the majority of them, which in the House, for most bills, all you need is 31 votes to pass, if a total of 31 people agree that it's a good idea, it's going to pass the House, and then it's going to go to the Senate. And then the whole, the exact same process that happened in the House happens in the Senate. If the Senate also agrees, if they have 16 senators, because it's a simple majority for most of this, if 16 people in the Senate agree that this change is good, then you send it over to the governor. And the governor then decides whether to sign the bill into law or veto the bill. Um, most, it's very, it, most bills are signed. Once it gets to the governor's office, it's very rare. Um, the percentage of bills that get veto every year is, is very minimal, um, very small, usually less than 20 bills. And we're talking about an average three to 400 bills passed. So it's, it's not a significant percentage. Last year, because it was such a special year with COVID, none of the bills were veto. I mean, they ended session early. So everything that 70 laws were passed by, um, by March and the governor signed every single one of them. And most bills, I would say, despite what you hear, there's a lot of very controversial issues, but most bills do pass with bipartisan support with both Democrats and Republicans supporting it. Lourdes, there's a question in the chat about concurrent bills or mirror bills. So if you can address that for, for the audience, that would be awesome. Yes. So for concurrent bill, mirror bills, so we call it, um, the beauty of having mirror bills is that if you manage to have a mirror bill, in theory, you would be able to swap them and which would expedite the process of such bill. Um, so if you had a House bill and a Senate bill identical and they both pass their chamber, um, instead, of, instead of the Senate voting instead of the of the senate repeating the entire process that happened in the house what what would happen then you would swap at that point where it's called third read where people vote on on the bill in the senate you would just skip the committee you would skip the floor you would skip everything and procedurally you will swap the bills and the senate would then vote on on the house on the house bill that already passed and got the 60 mem whatever number of members in the, in the house to pass so you would swap it and it's very um it's a really cool tool because you expedite it the issue with concurrent bills this year we have a ton of concurrent bills um and it's because a lot of us uh advocates and and legislators themselves didn't know how COVID was going to be and we didn't know if we were going to have to shut down the legislature in, in February, in March. Um, so there was a lot of bills with the intention, mirror bills, with the intention of hoping to swap them. Unfortunately, most of those bills are not getting swapped because in order for you to swap that, you need, you need the agreement from both leadership teams in the House and Senate, meaning the President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, to agree. And, and it's really a procedural move. They have to agree that they're going to swap it. And this year, the folks met in January, the leadership teams, and they created a list of bills they had agreed that they were, they were going to swap. And if your bill's not on that list, it's, it's nearly impossible that even if you have two bills right now, you're not going to get it swapped. Uh, a lot of what happens at the legislature is it's it's dictated by who is in power. Um, most of it is dictated by who's in power, especially when it comes to process and the, sp the speaker and the, and the Senate president have a lot of control of what's heard and what's voted. So some bills were swapped, some were not. Um, and most and whatever swapped usually is for this year at least, uh, the requirement would be it would be bills that doesn't cost money. So it doesn't have an impact to the general fund because anything that costs money to the state usually has to be negotiated within the state budget. So, you know, 
you see this, there's a lot of boxes there. There's a lot of things moving, a lot of uh, procedural issues. But the key thing that really matters is who are the key players, right? Who's involved in all this? So you have um, a lot of people involved, you, but, but the main three folks that you would think are involved are obviously the policymakers. You need a senator or a representative who wants to introduce a bill. And then their staff, their staff are a huge part of the process. They're the ones navigating all these hundreds of bills going through um, that are going to help them. The agencies, they're involved because they're guiding the legislators and advising us to what's good and bad in some cases. Um, and then you have advocates, which is it's by far the in my opinion, the main key player. You have advocates that could be in, they could come in many forms. It could be people like like me, who's a professional lobbyist, I get paid to go to the Capitol and represent people like going oh, education, right? I am I'm what is considered a professional lobbyist. But you also have the best influence, which is just, just advocates that care about issues, uh, members of the public, members of organizations that come in to the state capitol, they put in the work, they put in the time, and they work with the legislators to make their voices heard. And, and the way they can do that, it's in a lot of different ways. It could be through uh, their involvement and membership with other organizations, like what we have here with Instituto and ONED, um, and, and many others. And then you have members of the public, right? that can join in and then the last one would be the executive because remember anything that goes through you could have the perfect idea that becomes the law that passes and if the governor is not in support of that uh he can veto that and theoretically you could overturn it if uh, if the legislature wants to do that, but the legislature has not overturned a governor's veto in the last 30 years at least. So it's very difficult to overturn a governor's veto. So those are the key players um, that are involved. And, and you know, obviously, uh, I think from my perspective that the main important piece is when you have members of the public contact their legislators. And we'll talk more about that in the next in the next uh, slides. But we've talked a lot about things, so I thought I would kind of give you a little glimpse of what it is that we're talking here, what, what like the actual a committee meeting, right? Because the committee meetings are the ones that would be the more available to the public to participate. Not to say that if you miss a committee meeting on a bill, you lose your chance and you cannot engage. There's still a lot of ways to engage, but the most direct way the public can engage is through the committee by either testifying or submitting our, uh, a position through the request to speak system. And we'll talk a little more about it. But I, we wanted to show you, since we cannot be at the Capitol, we cannot walk you through the buildings, we cannot take you to the committee rooms. I wanted to show you a quick bill, um, just like snaps and, and short synopsis of, a, of a, a video, because everything that happens at the Capitol, we can access that through video right now. Well, let me say, everything that happens with public hearings. There's a ton of meetings that happen that none of us have access to, right? Because they, they happen within the, the doors, um, closed doors, and we don't have access to that. And sadly, one of the main ones that happens is when they're negotiating a state budget. Those negotiations meetings, um, most people are not, they don't have access to any of that. The, the real negotiations, we have access to the public testimony, but that's after the fact a lot of times. So here is, um, I'm going to just click on this and take you to the video of a bill that um, ON Education has been very involved in and very supportive of. If it's a bill that uh, would, and I just give you an overview before I open it, but it's uh, SCR 1020, which is a bill that would impact uh, English la language learners. And uh, essentially it would be a referendum that if it passes both House and Senate, just to complicate a little more of the process, it doesn't have to go to the governor. If it passes both House and Senate, it's sent to the Secretary of State, and then the Secretary of State has to put it on the next general election for, for all Arizona voters to decide whether or not is a good idea. And what the bill would do, it would essentially repeal the law that is known as English only that requires as of now um, students uh, to be to learn 
English only when they're before they become proficient in English, they cannot get instruction in any other form, um, in any other language. They, it has to be in English. So it's something that has been very detrimental to the Latino community and honestly to you know any 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 English learner who's not been able to be um, integrated into a nor a classroom with other peers who speak English. Um, so we wanted to show you just what the committee looks like. And I'm not gonna go through the whole thing cause it's like 15 minutes, but I'm just gonna kind of show you what it looks like. Um, so you guys have a little bit of an idea and then you're gonna recognize some of these people because the sponsor of this bill uh, will be coming and he's gonna be one of our speakers um, shortly after. So one second. The the key here is that you you have to know which bill number. It's not as easy as you would think that you know exactly where when it was put in. You have to figure out the timestamp. One of five. There it is. Oop. So this. Can you guys hear anything? No. Okay, so I'm having some connections here with, you may not be able to hear. What about now? Okay. So I'm gonna be quiet for a little bit. This is a sponsor. Going forward, I know that there are certain things in the legislator's career that stick with you. Uh, and one of them actually was a, a kind of a field trip that I think Mr. Gray was even on. Uh, with me, we went to uh, Salt Lake City and we learned a lot about language immersion uh, uh, with a program we were looking at at the time. And I know that we ran a bill at the time. I don't think it made it through, but there are numerous other schools of thought. And here's what happens when we go through a period of time. We we learn uh, different methods and we learn uh, that that uh, the, perhaps what was uh, the preferred method isn't the most um, uh, isn't isn't the best as far as educating uh, our children, and I think that um, uh, it's time to go ahead and put this back up. As, as Mr. Fillmore discovered, the most the more that he uh, dove into it. So with that, uh, happy to answer anything that comes up. But uh, we do have some folks that are signed. I think four individuals signed in to speak as well. Members, any questions for the sponsor? Great. Uh, we do have a few folks wishing to speak, as the sponsor said. We have Anna Manzano, Kate Van Rokul, and Jeff Esposito. So if Anna is available. And if you would, Thank for the records, you. state your name. Sorry. If you wish for the record, state your name, who you're representing, if anybody, and there is a three minute time limit. And welcome to the Senate Education. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Boyer, committee members. My name is Anna Manzano. I'm the dual language program coordinator in the Tucson Unified School District. I've been an educator for 23 years, and uh, in that time, I've taught students various bilingual education models. I'm here today in strong support of SCR 1020. So that's just kind of showing, we're gonna pause that. And that's just kind of showing that was the sponsor talking that was a member of the community coming in to testify in support it's a uh, someone from tucson unified school district but it could be anyone right it could be a parent um so it just kind of shows the sponsor of a bill will come in they will talk about why it's a good idea and then you're going to have public input come in and out um to, to determine whether or not the committee is going to advance the idea. In this case, the bill passed uh, with unanimous support and it's still moving through the process. So I'm going to log off of that and come back to our PowerPoint. Um, now you see here, and because I was having some connection issues, I think, I think we're back to normal now. But you can see here, there's another link here that says live, uh, live events. And if we wanted to, we could track things that are happening right now as we speak at the Capitol. We're not going to do that for time purposes, but I just wanted to show you that no matter where you are, whatever time of the day, if you were to click on this link um, and you and you see anything that says live, you just click on the videos and it will show you 
live stream line, uh, a live streaming of what's happening at the state capitol. Um, obviously, it gets complicated if you don't know what you're trying to track, but it's just something to show that th there's ways to get involved if we were trying to. Don't so, be, like that's life. What you see we right now, that's actually the, life. The wrong population. We we know that many seriously mentally ill are in jail. So. Yes. There's a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if you want to address them. Um, so the first one is, how do you get picked to speak? Yes. So anyone could speak, obviously. Um, I think the key is, how do you track the things that you care about, right? When there's thousands, like oh, hundreds of bills. Um, Typically what works is if you are affiliated with an organization, the organization is going to keep you informed of what's happening, what their priorities, you communicate through, like I'm just going to use ONED in this case, you would communicate with Stephanie, with Anais, with members of ONED and say, hey, there's this bill, SCR 1020, I really like, can I go and, and speak in support of it? Then what we would do is uh, I would come in and kind of guide you through the process to how to sign in, how to, you know, how to go. And there's a lot of more steps now because of Zoom, but how to go to and navigate it. But um, you could also simply, if you find a bill that you like, um, the key thing is to to create a register, um, a RTS account, which we're going to talk about later. But once you create an RTS account, um, you could just sign in and support in a, in a position of any bill. And it's uh, typically... I say typically because typically anyone that signs in is going to speak if they want to. In some cases where you have very controversial bills due to time limitations, the chairperson of the committee will say, I'm only letting four people uh, on each side of the, of the aisle speak. Um, so there's some, you know, there's some special cases, but most of the time is you, you would just communicate with the, you know, you would just have an RTS account and do that. What was the next question, Anais? Um, the next question is about SCR 1020. The question is, is this bill for English only or for bilingual resources in school? So the bill itself repeals the English only, but what it allows for, it's really, and um, it would empower schools to uh, to do dual language, to, in, to apply any type of uh, practices within their school district that benefit dual language. Um, th the reason why the testifier, the testifier talked a lot about if we weren't restricted as a school to only, only speak in English, we could be so much more innovative in how we're teaching students. And we can really bring in and merge our English students, our English native speaking students with non-English native students to learn from each other and to really instead of looking at English learners as, okay, they don't speak English, we're going to have to put X, X effort on them, like it's, it's harder for them to learn, instead is to really use the fact that they are non-English speakers as an asset and use our students to really come into and merge with the other peers and learn from each other rather than just keep them separate, um, you know, within each other. So it's, it's really would enhance dual language practices in general, which everyone would agree, I think, on this call that by, if you're bilingual, trilingual, it's going to make a huge difference in your life. Um, and it's an economic development in every single aspect of things. Next question. That was it. Okay. So then we can go to advocacy. And Shelly's going to help me a little bit here. I'm keeping track of time um, just to make sure we're on, on, we have eight more minutes for a couple more slides here to keep, make sure we're on time here. But advocacy, right? Um, how do you get engaged? So I think first and foremost, when you think of advocacy, it requires you, in order for you to create a change anywhere, and advocacy doesn't have to just happen at the legislature. It can happen within your local communities, and it happens within your local communities. But in order for you to create any change, I think a big component is you have to inspire people to buy into what you think is important. After that, you have to build support, right? You have to build support within your community to determine how you're going to then make a change and advocate for some some law change or whatever the case may be in your in your um, circumstance and then you have to figure out a plan to execute right you have to deliver that change so the way that you know simple ways to advocate for us is one just 
think of you as you got to find guidance, right? You got to find a, a group that can guide you through this process because it's not a, it's not that simple. It's complicated. There's a lot of ins and outs at the state capitol that normal average folks out there don't have the time to figure out how to navigate the legislative process. So you you have to find some level of guidance and then you have to voice what issues and concerns you have. But the main one is then you have to communicate, right? You have to share and share your insight, share your stats, share examples of why a, a bill change a proposed bill would impact your community. Um, and then you have to engage, right? So the engage is probably, that's the key factor. How do you engage? How do you, how do you become part of uh, advocate group? Uh, but more importantly, what's key I think for advocacy is persistence. We know that oftentimes um, we are not gonna be able to change one thing in one year, in one month. It is gonna take some, some level of work. So we have to collaborate with each other um, and then be persistent with our efforts. And I know that Instituto and ONED are, are great and what they do and great leaders in advocacy. So I wanted to have Shelly come in and kind of help me a little bit here um, because she is an expert in relationship building and she's, she's one of those people who really shine the light as to how do we get involved and motivated and, and come in, in in a group together to advocate. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this session so far. Um, this is such great information. My name is Shelly Jackson. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am Instituto's Deputy Director of Training and Engagement. I'm also a newly elected school board member for Roosevelt School District here in South Phoenix. So um, education is something I hold near and dear to my heart. So I'm glad all of you hold it near and dear as well um, as you're here to learn a little bit more about the legislative process and some key education bills that are happening um, here in Arizona. So let's talk about relationship building. Um, this is so, so, so important to get to the goals that we want. Um, you'll see here on the slide that it says it is important for you to know your legislator by name. Yes, it is important. Um, but I think it is even more important for your legislator to know you by name. Um, as Lorda said in the beginning, the legislative process actually only takes place between January till about end of April, beginning of May. That is a short amount of time to try to pass the bill, to try to build a relationship, to try to do all the ins and outs. Um, there's also a very limited time to actually introduce a bill. I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head, um, but I believe it's like beginning of February, you actually, after that, you can't introduce a bill anymore. And so it is important that we use our off time um, to actually build those relationships with the people who are in the state legislature. And so for me, I think that after May, once our legislators are coming down off of the high <laughs> of working on some crazy, crazy hours between January and May, is the perfect time for you to actually reach out to those folks and get to know them. Um, it sounds like a big feat, but actually, um, they like that. <laughs> it's hard to, to make those relationships while they're trying to pass bills, as Lorda said, as they are also trying to um, have those behind the scenes meetings, right? Like there's a lot going on. And so you can start to build those relationships by simply one, reaching out to your legislator and thanking them if they're doing something great. Um, if you did do them, see them do some great work in the legislative session, you may want to express that and then maybe ask them um, to hop on a quick call or in a COVID safe way, um, get, get coffee or something like that, but something to let them know that you're watching them. I, I think on the flip side, you can also voice some concerns, right? And that doesn't have to be in a super bombarded way, but if they did vote a certain way and you wanted to get some more insight on why they did that, instead of maybe thanking them, you may want to ask them to have a further conversation about why they voted a certain way and why that concerns you. This at least has a first point of contact and that tells them, okay, this person is watching me, <laughs> this person is informed or wants to be informed. So those are some first uh, steps that you can do to start to build a relationship with your state legislator. You probably are thinking, great, Shelly, but like, who is this person? Or like, I don't even know what district I live in. That's okay. We're going to figure it out right now. So you can actually find your legislative district by going to um, this website that we have here on the slide. And I think Stephanie just dropped it in the chat. Um, and I see people saying congrats in the chat. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yes, you can um, find your legislative district by going to that link. 
Mm -hmm. Once you go to that link, it'll send you to a page that looks like this. Once you get there, you'll put in your address and I know I'm going fast, so don't worry. Um, tomorrow, I'm gonna actually send out an email that has all this information in it. So if you don't catch it now, don't worry, we'll send it in an email. But once you get here, you'll put in your address and after your address, it should take you to this slide and it'll tell you who's in, um, who what congressional district you're in. Um, so your congressional district and your legislative district are different. Um, your congressional district is who represents you on the federal level. Your legislative district is exactly what Lourdes was talking about. These are the people in our state um, who work at the state capitol. And so you can see here for this address, uh, legislative district 27. Mm -hmm. and, and then, then after, after that, there, go ahead, Lourdes. <laughs> and after that, once you got your numbers figured out, you would click to that other link that Shelly's going to be great at providing you. But since I'm showing the screen here, I'll just walk you through it. Once you figure out, let's let's say that you are in legislative district um, 29, because that's the first one here. So 29, you find find your number. Actually, I'm going to go with 27 because we're going to meet them. So you're going to go with 27. I'm in Legislative District 27. That's my old home. I, I, I grew up in South Phoenix. So then you figure out who is your legislator and that you're like, well, OK, great. How do I call them? Well, you click on their name. It has their office line. And if you call, they they may not pick up right away, but they all have an assistant and they are really great people. So you call and you could leave a message, you know, if they don't pick up, but you can call them, leave a message, say, I'm a constituent in, in LD27. I would like to meet with Representative Bolding about X, Y, or C. And you can also email them. And if you if you were to click here, I'll take you to their email. But if you just want to know who they are, because we don't you don't need to call and talk to people, if you just want to know who they are. Most of the members will have a little link here that shows like a quick bio, what they do, their background, when they got elected, um, the bills that they are running either uh, as a support or as a, a main bill. Anytime you see a P next to a bill number, it means that they are the primary sponsor of that idea. So if you wanted to track that, you can do that. Um, and yeah, that's how you find, you know, your legislators, you can, that was a house ro uh, roster, that's where the 60 people are at, but then you go to the Senate and you do the same thing, you find 27, because that's the number that we said we live in, you click on the person's name, you find out who's your senator, same process, there's their name, I forgot to say earlier, here it shows what committees they're in, she, she's a minority leader, which means she's not doing a lot of committee work, but she is in the rules committee. And then you can find out as well from Senator Rios, her background, and you'll get to meet her later because she's one of our panelists, but um, you just find out by clicking there and we'll, we'll provide you all that information as well in the follow-up email. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, so yeah, if you're a regular degler <laughs> uh, citizen, it is really hard to engage in a process, especially um, because it's not very comprehensive in our schools either, right? Um, the good thing is that we do have people, individuals and organizations who are doing this type of work who can help you along the way. Um, again, in the follow-up email, I'll send a list of, of, of organizations here in, in Arizona that are doing specific work on specific topics. So that way you can plug into that work. Um, from here, we're actually gonna go ahead and start to transition into the amazing people that we have on the call who can tell you a little bit more about advocacy and what that looks like. And we're actually gonna start off with Alexis Aguirre. Um, um, who is a Roosevelt School Board uh, member alongside me. We just got elected together. But aside from um, Alexis being a school board member, she has also been an education advocate for years. She is a mother as well. And so she can speak from many different perspectives. And I am so thankful that she's on the call with us today. Alexis, I'm going to pass it to you. If you want to just tell us a little bit more about yourself and your journey and what advocacy looks like for you and maybe the different ways that you have advocated in the past aside from school board as well. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I am so excited to have joined the Roosevelt School Board alongside Shelly. We were, um, you know, unexpectedly became candidates and are now, you know, school board members. But as Shelly had mentioned, um, I have a 
14 year old son and a four year old daughter and um, having grown up in foster care and, you know, struggled to get into college and become an educator. Um, I definitely felt like I was just keeping my head above water um, and just kind of felt like, well, I'm just a mom, you know, I'm just, you know, taking care of my, my child and I don't really have a lot of time for a lot of, a lot of extracurricular activities um, outside of, you know, just maintaining my family and, and my, and my job. But as I kept seeing um, different issues coming up around my son's education and then going back and getting my teaching certificate, um, I actually started as a kindergarten aide uh, in the classroom and then became a public school librarian and decided I wanted to dig into the classroom and become uh, a certified teacher and teach dual language and teach students who uh, are learning in English and Spanish. So I teach at Encanto School in the Osborne School District in Central Phoenix. Um, I have over 14 years now working in education. So um, the biggest thing for parents to know is that you are the loudest voice in the room as far as like what your teachers and your principals and superintendents and school boards are going to be listening to. But because um, it's like, how are the hot dogs made? I'm not sure, you know, like you can get really um, thrown off when you go into that that principal's office because I think it kind of takes us back even as a teacher it takes me back to being in second grade and being in trouble <laughs> and um, knowing that you are the biggest advocate for your child and so if there is an issue that you're having um, you know going to the teacher and advocating for your child advocating for what their needs are and then taking it up with the principal and figuring out what your needs are going to be there and knowing that we're all on the same page like we all want to be on the same team working towards um, what your family needs and um, but sometimes we just need more uh, more folks on the team so we can figure out what the best course of action is going to be. And the same thing, if if it, you feel like we still need, you know, we still need some more um, some more resources, you know, bringing it to your school board. I know Shelly and I have, you know, as a brand new school board members, we're super excited to meet families and meet staff and you know there's only so much time right now going around but definitely reaching out directly to those people in charge um, because really you're the one you're you're your child's first and lifelong school um, not not just school advocate but lifelong teacher and so you're the one that knows your child best and you're going to be the one who is going to be advocating from pre-k all the way up to make sure that they get what they need. Shelly is there uh, specific questions that you want me to address or I don't know if there's any other questions in the chat when it comes to parents? Yeah, that's, that was great. Thank you so much. That's something we haven't covered too much on this call yet. So I appreciate you talking from the parents' perspective. Um, maybe before you leave us, adding any other insight that helps you in your advocating as a teacher? Um, is it that telling your story is the most powerful? Is it that um, uplifting other people's voices? What are some um, advocacy tools in your toolbox that you use while um, making sure that you're talking about education and raising concerns to people? Definitely. Well, parents can can say a lot of things that us as teachers can't. So when I'm in when I'm in my teacher role in my room 17, you know, I can only say so much. But as a parent, you can really like put it out there and really make it clear as to if there is an issue, you know, that there there's 33 kids in this classroom and that's not OK, you know, or why is it that I am having to buy all of these things on the supply list, you know, when there are there's COVID funds. And so wh who why aren't we buying child size masks? Why are we not? Um, supplying the students with with the things that they need, right? As a parent, you can really get to the heart of the matter and really uplift um, the voices of of folks that can't. And I've I've seen, you know, how our parents that maybe don't speak English um, or who are working three jobs, you know, they're not able to directly advocate in the way that some of us who do have what we call that 
education capital that we, we understand how the system works and who to go to can advocate for all of our students to say, you know, it's great that I can buy headphones for my child, but what about the parents that can't buy headphones for their child? How are we able to support not just my kid, but all of the kids that are in this classroom? And so I'm also part of AU Arizona Educators United. We have um, a Facebook group for parents and allies. Um, but really, you know, taking that advocacy from the schoolhouse then to the legislature, like you said, and telling your story and saying, um, not only am I a parent, but I am a voter. And my child has been in school for X amount of years, like my 14 year old son has never seen a fully funded classroom his entire life. You know, and now that my daughter is going into kindergarten next year, I hope that she has a different experience. And I expect and will hold you to that standard as my lawmakers that you will make a change of course and fully fund our classrooms because we can't have another generation of kids growing up in the worst state for funding and supporting education and expecting our educators to just work miracles, um, which they are, you know, um, because our kids deserve better and we can't keep running our teachers out of, out of this profession. Thank you, Alexis. I know you have to go, so I just have one last quick question. For the people who are on the call, who are here in support of education, who are here just trying to learn more and they may not be a parent, how would you, what would you tell those folks? Um, what are ways that they can uplift um, other advocates' voices or parents' and teachers' voices? For folks at the legislature? Yes. Definitely. Um, you know, since as an educator, you know, we have to really walk that fine line um, of, of you know, um, making sure that we're uplifting our schools and our school districts, but then there is the ugly side of things. You know, the 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 things that we have to take on as our uh, on our own um, to be able to just get through the day. And we we our students are like an extension of ourselves. They're our kids. So what I would give my own son is what I would give all my other students. And if that means I have to pay it out of my pocket or take that extra time to do it, I do that because I love my students. Now, we shouldn't expect that of all of our, all of our teachers, but we do. And so um, telling those stories at the legislature, you know, we, we work um, our contract hours to certain times and then we take our work home. So we're not able to necessarily um, you know, be there and tell our stories in person or now via Zoom. Um, but telling those stories during during that time when they're debating it, even if we know we're going to lose on a certain bill, so at least it's on record. It's on record that you know we had fifty educators call us this week, and this is let me just let me just read you one of their stories um, so that we can have that as evidence and as proof so that when we do get around to that time when we're knocking doors we can say these these folks are fierce advocates for education for your child and as Shelly and I were knocking on doors you know throughout um, you know this this crazy last electoral season we know that education still remains the number one issue on voters minds so we want to be able to really point that out to folks in this next um, this next round. Thank you so much, Alexis. I know you have to go, so folks can join me in the chat by showing Alexis some love. Thank you for spending some time with us today. I appreciate you so much. Um, we're gonna go ahead and go to our next portion of our um, of the day, which is our panelists. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Stephanie, but really quickly, I just want to do a recap of some of the gems that Alexis just dropped, right? So knowing that parents do have a voice, um, parents are able to advocate for their students, not only at school board, but all the way to the state legislator. And we should continue to encourage our parents to do that. But also knowing that educators have a specific um, perspective. And if our educators are too busy um, with our kids and us, as constituents, as people in the community, we should do our part to uplift our teachers' voices as well. Um, thank you, Alexis, again. I appreciate you. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Stephanie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shelly. And I am so um, thrilled that, that we have two incredible leaders from the legislature joining us today. Uh, we are hoping that uh, Senator Shope will, will be able to make it. Um, uh, unfortunately, he is tied up in committee. 
this is kind of how this works. Legislators during session, uh, committees can run long. Um, and so hopefully he can, he can hop on, but we are so excited that we have uh, Representative Pollock uh, who represents District 18 uh, in Chandler. And I'd like to turn it over to Representative Pollock to tell us uh, something interesting about yourself to start off the conversation. Oh, well, thank you for being here today. I wasn't expecting that question. Something interesting. Um, I suppose something that's interesting and maybe a little strange or unique is that I am a mom of identical twin girls who were hours shy of being conjoined. So that's pretty unusual. Very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're us. welcome. Yes. Um, and Ms. Pollock is also an educator, so uh, it is great to have um, educators down at the legislature advocating for all of our students. So thank you, Ms. Pollock, for joining us. Uh, and then we also have uh, Minority Leader uh, Rebecca Rios, who represents Legislative District 27 in South Phoenix. Um, Senator Rios, or Leader Rios, excuse me, are you on? And, and the question for you, um, is what is the most interesting thing um, about being in the legislature? Most interesting thing about being in the legislature. Wow, that, that's a great question. And, and since I've been here off and on for 26 years, <laughs> um, I think it's uh, the people you meet, the, the, the vast array of personalities and uh, opinions of, of folks and, and really trying to make friends with people that see the world vastly different than you. <laughs> How's that for politically correct? That's great. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much uh, again, both of you for, for joining us today. Uh, a couple questions for you. And then certainly folks, if you guys have questions for um, Representative Pollock or Senator Rios, please drop them in the chat. I'll be sure to, to lift them up for you. But I'd love to kick us off. Um, what is, uh, as far as you've seen thus far, and I know you guys are in different chambers, so you might have some dif different perspectives um, right now. Um, what is one of the most impactful bills for Latino students uh, that is uh, moving through the legislature currently? What would you say? You wanna go first? Oh, it doesn't um, matter, either way. Gosh, well, go ahead and go first. Okay, no problem. I actually have two that I'm really excited about. The first is House Bill 2015, which is the preschool block development grants. We haven't funded preschool in Arizona at the state level since 2011. And this would step us back into funding preschool, quality preschool. And the program starts with families that are at 200% of the federal poverty level. So we're starting there because we don't have buckets of money to provide universal preschool for everybody, but this would be a start and it would be a fantastic start to ensure that our students are having a very strong foundation before they even enter kindergarten. And then the other bill that I'm very excited about, and it's interesting because we heard one version of it the first week of committee back in January, and we heard another version of it just this week in committee, um, and that is repealing English only. So this would allow us to be able to have the dual language classes in our schools, and it would just be so much better for children because we wouldn't be isolating them when they're trying to learn a new language. Awesome, thank you so much, Representative Pollock. And we did, um, Lourdes covered that bill. It is one that All in Education is very supportive of and actually the uh, bill sponsor, I know the House version was sponsored or introduced by uh, Representative Fillmore and um, uh, Senator Shope introduced the, the Senate version. So we're very excited. Uh, to, to see that moving forward and appreciate your continued support on that issue. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Leader Rios, uh, any, anything from your kind of line of sight that you say would, would uh, significantly impact Latino students and Latino families that, that you think this group needs to be aware of? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, um, Representative Pollock, for highlighting two really positive pieces of legislation that can benefit Latino families. 
I'm going to take the other side and I'm going to talk about two bills that I think will be detrimental um, to Latino children and public education overall. So um, really all children that attend public education. One is Senate Bill 1783, and it is essentially a bill sponsored by Senator Mesnard that will do an end run on Proposition 208, right? Proposition 208 that teachers and their allies worked so hard to get on the ballot. It just passed um, this past November, and we have a governor and a Republican legislature that were none too happy about the fact that real people took it in their own hands to fund public education because this legislature has failed to do so for decades. So what they are attempting to do is essentially make those high wage earners, about 9,000 millionaires, make them whole, essentially provide a tax cut to those folks so that that revenue that would have come in um, under Prop 208 will be cut at least in half. Um, it's, it's abhorrent. I mean, it is um, just a very blatant attack on voters' rights, on what parents and teachers and, and pretty much most Arizonans um, want to do, which is fund public education. So again, Senate Bill 1783, we need to kill that bill. Um, it's passed out of the Senate. It's passed out of the first House committee. Um, and so you need to you know, lobby House um, representatives over there. The second bill, again, has passed out of the Senate and is now in the House of Representatives. And it is Senate Bill 1452, um, sponsored by Senator Boyer. And it essentially expands you know, ESAs to about 70% of all public school children. Now, my Republican colleagues will say that it's school choice and parents should have school choice, to which I say absolutely. And about 90% of the parents choose public schools. And that's why we should be funding public schools. But in a nutshell, this piece of legislation will blow open um, the use of, of STO and ESAs or vouchers, public tax dollars that people can take to educate their child in a private school. And we know that when that happens, it's the public schools where the majority of our children remain that then go without funding. So that one is going to be, I think, extremely detrimental if it gets through the whole process. Again, two bills that ultimately are going to affect the level of funding available at public schools for all children and for Latino children, children of color that tend to be in lower socioeconomic areas with schools that maybe have a lower you know, school rating. So those are two, those are two bills that, that I think we need to ask for your ad, advocacy on to oppose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leader Rios. And uh, for another question for both of you, um, what is, what's the best advocacy tip you can offer to new advocates? So a lot of the folks in the room might be new to the legislature, new to navigating, um, how to use, you know, elevate their voices and perspectives with lawmakers. So what, what tips uh, would you offer uh, to our group today? Do you want to start, Senator? Sure, I can start. Um, you know, I would say, don't be intimidated, right? Even if you've never been down here, if you've never talked to a legislator, don't be intimidated. I would encourage you to pick up the phone if you want to call and say, hey, I would like your support on this bill or opposition to that bill. Never be afraid to call directly. I guarantee you, you're not going to end up talking to the senator or representative. They're probably going to be in committee, but they will get a real phone message. And I, I've been here since the day before we had computers and people would make phone calls and you know return calls. It can be very effective. I would stay away from you know mass form emails if you can, because those are very easy for legislators to ignore. Um, I would... Just personalize an email. It doesn't have to be lengthy. In fact, we prefer when they are short and sweet. Um, in that subject line, I think you catch legislators' attention when you say, I'm a registered voter in your district because we're all political animals down here. We all want to be reelected. And so I think you need to identify yourself as such and then tell them what it is that you um, would like to see them do. Um, 
always call and see if you can visit with your legislator right now clearly because of COVID, it's not an opportunity. Um, but next session, it will be. I, I have an open door policy. I meet with anyone and everyone. Um, legislators vary, but I will tell you a lot of people do meet with um, people and constituents and you can really establish a personal relationship with a legislator that is ongoing. You know, over the course of the last 20 some years, I probably have four or five people that have maintained contact with me. And when they call me on a given issue and they typically are um, concerned about one issue, I will sit and I will um, contemplate what they want me to do. And if it doesn't go against, you know, my values or other organizations that I support, then I will in fact vote the way that, that they like. Um, so I would, I would encourage you to um, create a relationship with your legislators. And I concur with so much of that. I always encourage my constituents when they're emailing to, to give me their zip code. If they're not comfortable giving their whole address, give the zip code. And then I know for sure that you live in my district. But I also know the zip codes of the districts that are close to me because I know a lot of the people that live in that area don't receive feedback from their um, legislators. So I'm happy to have them write to me as well. I would also say follow us on social media because I know how overwhelming it can be when you read in the newspaper or you read about all of these bad bills that are happening. It can be very overwhelming, but if you follow us on social media, you can see what's happening from day to day. You can see the little successes and you can see where we're really struggling. And that's where your voice can be very helpful. Um, as far as calling your representatives, what I would say there, I found out a few weeks ago that the phones are being transferred to our assistants, personal cell phone numbers. So please don't call them after business hours or on the weekends because it's interrupting their personal life when they're not on the clock. So if you can make your phone calls during the day, that would be super. You always can email. Um, we do get hundreds of emails every single day. So please don't have hurt feelings if you don't get a response. There are many of us who do read our emails and I track the emails that are coming in both in district and out of district. And that's something I post on my Facebook once a month. So I can see what were the most important issues to the voters in my district and what were the most important issues to voters in Arizona. Sometimes it's not the same. And that's kind of interesting. Um, I do welcome conversations with people who live in my area because I want to know what their opinions are and why their opinions are such. As Stephanie noted, my background is education. I left the classroom in 2016, but a lot has changed since then. So it's really important to me to still have contact